All right, hey everybody. Um, here we are as our spe- our second spiritual conference. Our first one, we did an overview of Lexio Divina. That was um, three weeks ago now, I think. Um, yeah, so I want to keep doing this from here on out, basically every Friday, uh, in addition to adoration. So I just want to go a little bit deeper into Lexio uh, this week and then finish it up maybe next time we have a Friday. Uh, So we talked about the four stages of Lexio Divina being reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. So we read a little bit of Guigo's Ladder of Monks in which he describes this. And he gives us this this analogy for, or a bunch of analogies for the process of Lexio Divina. One of those analogies is uh, reading is putting food whole into the mouth. Meditation chews that food and breaks it up. Prayer extracts the flavor, and then contemplation is the sweetness itself, which gladdens and uh, refreshes. He uses this analogy of a grape. I just want to highlight a few aspects of, or a few moments in this reading here. You read on the function of reading and the function of meditation. All right, so he gives this example. Let's say that we're meditating on or praying with the text, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay, Uh, this is one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's among this list of eight of eight beatitudes. All right. So he says, when the soul has carefully examined this text, it says to itself, there may be something good here. Okay. What he's getting at here, reading seeks to understand the basic meaning of the text. The basic meaning of this text is that purity of heart is something that's desirable because those who are pure in heart are blessed. And their reward is to see God. In other words, the beatific vision, this direct vision of God in heaven. All right. So purity of heart is desirable because it it comes with this reward of seeing God directly in heaven. Okay. And beginning to experience that now. He says, so we see that there's something good here. So wishing to have a fuller understanding of this, the soul begins to bite and chew upon this grape. Okay. Again, that food analogy as though putting it in a wine press. While it, while it stirs up its power of reasoning to ask what this precious purity may be and how it may be had. All right, so this just marks the transition then from reading to meditation, which is a natural transition. Okay, if you're trying to understand the text and go a little deeper, that's going to naturally happen. So reading, you go, all right, so purity of heart's desirable because the reward is to see God. All right, so what is this purity and how do I get it? Okay, that's that's what meditation then digs into. Okay, so function of meditation then. He says, meditation applies itself to that work of discovering what is purity of heart and how do I get it? He says, meditation climbs higher. It goes to the heart of the matter. It examines each point thoroughly. Okay, so he then moves on to examine what is this purity of heart. This whole paragraph, he goes through other Uh, passages in scripture which refer to a pure heart or purity of heart. Okay, what kind of purity of heart that is. So um, what we hear, what we see him doing here is using scripture to interpret scripture. Okay, these are called intertextual echoes. So different parts of scripture talking about the same idea or the same topic or the same reality. In this case, purity of heart. Okay, so what we see here is the fact that the Bible is one unified discourse. It's one book, even though it's a series of different books written over the course of hundreds, maybe even a thousand years by a variety of different authors in different languages. Okay. But it's all divinely inspired. So it's really all one book written by God. Okay. So the more we read and contemplate scripture, the more we get a, we become living libraries in a sense of scripture. And so we read one passage like this beatitude, and we start to think of the Psalms where David talks about purity of heart. I think of wisdom literature where it talks about having a pure heart. Okay. And so all of these different passages come together and help us to understand what Jesus is talking about in this beatitude on a whole new level. Okay. So through calling to mind all of these different parts of scripture, then uh, we come to see that as he says on the next page, okay, 
Uh, this passage has acquired a new dimension by being hammered out on the anvil of meditation. In other words, newer and deeper meanings beyond that literal sense pop up. Okay, so we understand the literal sense, purity of heart is desirable because those who have it see God directly. Okay, that's that's a desirable thing. But now with all of these different passages of scripture come to mind, uh, we have newer and deeper meanings, a much deeper understanding of what Jesus is talking about here. The same goes for what it means to see God. Okay, that calls to mind all kinds of other images from Scripture. Okay, so <clears throat> meditation then goes deeper. And then he says, when the soul is set alight by this kindling, and when its flames are fanned by these desires, it receives a first intimation of the sweetness, not yet by tasting it, but through its sense of smell. Uh, and from this, it deduces how sweet it would be to know by experience the purity that meditation has shown to be so full of joy. In other words, meditating on this passage and having all of these images and all of this meaning come to, come to the front of our minds makes us desire that purity of heart and desire to see God. All right. So all of that fans this flames, it sets alight this desire for God in our hearts. Okay. That's kind of the point of meditation there to stir up this love and desire for God. All right. So uh, he says meditation seeks the deeper meanings of the text, which leads to a deeper desire for these realities and for union with God, in other words. Okay. So here's the problem though. All right. He says, as long as it is meditating, so long is the soul suffering because it does not feel that sweetness, which as meditation shows belongs to purity of heart, but which it does not get. In other words, meditation makes us want it. And we kind of smell that union with God. And so we desire it. But meditation by itself does not give us that union with God. That's why meditation naturally leads to prayer, because it's only through prayer that we can then ask for that union and ask for the graces we need to obtain that union. Okay, so reading naturally leads into meditation as we go deeper into the meaning of the text. And meditation stirs up these desires for grace and for God, for union with him. And then prayer asks for those things. And as we will see, contemplation is when we receive that grace. Okay. So that is where we will leave off today. Just a very brief thing. And we'll pick up with church history on Monday. Thank you.